Oh, let's see. All right, and Julia, I see you now. <laughs> Hello, Julia. All right. So now I'm going to present this. All right. All right. Has everybody seen my screen? Yes. Yeah. Excellent. All right. So this is our third uh, lecture on marketing. And uh, so last time we talked about uh, market uh, about promotions and all about how to how to build a camp build. We talked about market driven promotions versus market driving promotions. Uh, market driving promotion market well market. Marketing for the theater needs to pay attention to external conditions, you know, economic and technological, and you know, things that are shaping the public needs more than uh, what the features of a particular product are. Um, I talked about how you know the Great Depression is an excellent example of this, with you know the big Busby Berkeley musicals that were distracting people from the fact that they were in these dire economic circumstances. Um, so that's a that's a thing to think about. And then and the other thing is is you know when we think about promotions, it's it's thinking about wants versus needs. Um, you know people want to buy a drill, but they buy they want to buy a drill because they need a hole in something. So when we're marketing theater, um, we want to talk about the hole in their lives that that people are going to be filling uh, with our theatrical product. Um, and then we talked about how to write good promotions. And the first thing we talked about was uh, text. Um, and to go bald when, when writing your ad copy, talk about benefits rather than features. Uh, be, speak in the active voice. Uh, is is to be avoided. Ha ha. No, you don't want to say that. You want to say avoid is, right? Just use the verb as God intended. Um, Less is more. Eliminate every unnecessary word. If you think it's, if you think it can be go, if, if you can get the meaning across, chop it out. Um, the mind can absorb only what the seat can endure. Was a very uh, was a uh, a phrase that my drama teacher used to drum into us. So less is definitely more. And then describing, not telling. Uh, let the audience decide how they want to feel emotionally about the words that you're that you're writing. Uh, let's see. And then we talked about uh, text and color and photo best practices. Um, you want one to two fonts, two colors maximum, three font sizes, and one to three people in photos. And that is the way to get attention and focus people on your message that you have just, your bald, your bald faced copy there. Mm -hmm. um, then uh, we went into some best practices on press releases, email marketing, banner ads, social media, and then there's some other uh, some other good information in the book. Um, I think probably the, the the big takeaway I think is about marketing in the theater is repetition is is key, and just making sure that you keep getting your message and your brand in front of people. Um, the more people. You know, the benefits of repetition are people get more familiar with you when, and familiarity breeds trust. Um, the more you are familiar with somebody or some fact, uh, the more you are likely to trust it, which leads to sales. And if you can convert people from, you know, just participating and buying your product into actually talking you up, then that is the, the circle of marketing life. Um, and you want people to become your advocate. So. All right. So now I'm going to turn over the mic to uh, Ms. Danny DeCito, who is uh, a Charlotte, North Carolina native with seven years of experience in the digital marketing and public relations industries. She's provided in-house PR and marketing support for North Carolina theater for two years. And before that, worked in various public relations agency in Raleigh, where she managed national and local client accounts. She has always had a passion for music and the arts. And the work she's doing at NC Theater combines her personal interest with her professional interest. She's a graduate of ECU, where she earned a BS in communication with a concentration in public relations, along with a minor in business administration. Go Pirates. Now, we've got some Pacers <laughs> fans, a few Pacers fans here, but I'm sure they won't hold it too much against you. So, yeah, all right, yeah. yeah so, so please welcome Danny DeCito. Hi, everybody. Let me make sure that we can shunt over to you. So uh, you should be able to hit present now. 
Yes. Oh, I see. So you'll see my presentation on my screen. Right. Okay. Let's do, I guess, a window. I haven't done yeah, it. You go, yeah, you can present a, oh, I would do present your entire screen. It's probably easier. Okay. Okay. Let me do that. All right. Entire screen. Yeah, we've been, sure. I, guess, I guess a lot of people have been using, um, what's it, um, Zoom, but we only have a 45 minute limit on Zoom, so. That's right, that's right. We've, uh, yeah, as far as what we've been doing internally with the theater, we've done a lot of Zoom, uh, mm -hmm. actually only Zoom, so. Uh, I'm, okay. bit, uh, I'm, I'm new to the Google Hangout, but are you seeing my presentation yes. here? Okay. Yes. I will do, make this. There you go. Longer. Yep. Does that work? That's it, perfect. Okay, great, perfect. Um, well, yes, thanks, Charles. Thank, or I'm sorry, Mr. Makalicki, for um, oh, having no, me today. Please, please <laughs> call me Professor Charles Makalicki. Professor Charles, great. Um, <laughs> you got the name close, Danny DeKito. Oh, I'm it. sorry, DeKito, okay. I'm sorry. It's, it's a little tricky. Um, but yeah, I, um, I'm really excited to talk to you guys today. This is actually my first um, presentation like this, and definitely my first virtual presentation. So we're all learning here. Um, what an interesting time for us to be talking, I think, because considering the state of everything right now, it's just, we're all kind of figuring things out as we go. So um, with that being said, I'll jump in. And Charles, how much time do I have? I, don't, I just want to be aware class, of that. Well, the class goes till 1150. So you've got about, so if you can, if, if you wanted to do like, think about 30 minutes and then 10 minutes for questions. I think we Perfect. Can. All right, awesome. Um, and a lot of the presentation, I mean, it's a little bit high level, but I think it's going to hit on some key points that you guys are talking about in class. Um, definitely things that I manage on a day-to-day -day basis and have, um, you know, my hands in personally. Um, I am kind of a mid-level manager, so I'm not in all of the decision-making meetings or in the, all of those processes, but I do understand them. I, you know, have to work within the restraints of all of these things every day, so I think I can give a good insight as to um, what you might be doing if you were ever in a role like mine in the theater. So, um, like I said, we're gonna hit on a couple things today. Um, we'll pretty much align with what you guys are talking about in class. So just a little bit of advertising and marketing 101. Um, you know, overall, what is a target market and how do we find our audience? Uh, what do they want from us and how do we determine that? Um, NC Theater show selection process and the marketing strategy around how we promote our shows um, and get that word out to our patrons. We're also going to talk a little bit about creative design. So how um, we determine the look and feel of our materials. Um, who does that? Who is um, a decision maker in the process and how all of that goes. Um, how we create our promotional materials and what those materials are. Um, a little bit of that can be talked about as we um, look at rights and what we're you know, able to use and what we're actually not able to use. So that definitely plays a part in um, the materials that we use. And then of course, I'm gonna end with a little bit of crisis communication talk and um, the marketing response. And like I said, right now in this time, that's all NC Theater has been doing for the past couple of weeks is really keeping up with trends, making sure our patrons are aware of what's going on and um, communicating that properly. So we'll kind of end with that. Um, and like Charles mentioned, I uh, graduated from ECU with a BS in communication. I concentrated in public relations um, and also got a business administration minor. I actually started as a business major and then I said, wait, there's way too much math involved here. So, <laughs> um, I need to get out while I can. Um, and communication was the perfect fit for me. I've always been a strong writer, um, love working with people, talking with people. Um, so that was, you know, an interest of mine from the beginning. And like I said, way less math. So win-win. Um, 
graduated in 2013, so have been out into the field about seven, eight years now. Um, it's, it's kind of interesting because this time now is being compared to the 9-11 um, time when people were graduating and trying to find jobs. And this is kind of a similar um, market that we're seeing right now, but hopefully we can bounce back. We'll see. Um, so just a little bit of a tip here, and I would say this for anybody, um, upon graduating, I kind of thought of my path as each job opportunity, internship, you know, part-time pay job, whatever it was, consider that as a stepping stone to your ultimate goal. And you may not know that right now. Um, I knew I wanted to be in the entertainment industry in some capacity. And I wanted to hopefully one day do um, in-house public relations and marketing for one brand, one company. Um, so the, the jobs I got along the way kind of helped me get to that point. And of course, you know, if you can land a job where you can combine your personal pa passions and interests, you know, with, with the skills that you have, of course, that's the ultimate goal. Um, some of my previous jobs, just to give you an idea of kind of how I got here. Um, I, my first job out of college was at a digital marketing startup in Charlotte, where I'm from, um, learned basically everything I know about social media management, um, digital marketing, did a lot of website editing, um, some coding there as well, which kind of helped me get the, um, first PR job that I got in Raleigh when I moved up here full time. Um, Actually, did I'll, I'll let you guys know what the, the agency names are in case you are interested in looking into them as far as um, internships or possible jobs. The first um, agency that I worked at was called MMI. They are now known as Bearing. They actually switched and rebranded, um, so they changed names. Um, so now they're Bearing. So that was my first agency job here in Raleigh. And I was there about a year and a half. And then I jumped to French West Vaughn. They're one of the biggest um, PR agencies in the Southeast. And that's where I really started to manage a lot of national clients. So jumped from managing more local small business companies to managing um, national kind of large scale clients. And um, again, really learned the fundamentals of PR, how to pitch, how to write, how to, again, keep managing those social media pages and really work with um, the in-house graphic teams and designer teams that we had at the agencies. I would say that's a big benefit of working at an agency. You get to see how all of these different teams work together and how you can really build a full scale, holistic marketing plan for a client. Um, it's a rough environment. It's it's not easy. It's very fast paced and it's it can be stressful, but I would recommend it for learning the basics of um, all those things I just mentioned. So, and like I said, uh, the stars kind of aligned and I landed at NC Theater in 2018. Funny enough, um, the first agency I worked at, NC Theater was my client. So I had known about the theater, worked with them hand in hand for a couple years, actually before going in house. Um, that was kind of a unique situation. I know that won't be the same for everybody, but you know, it helped me understand the goals of the theater in advance. I didn't really have to learn a lot of the background before I got, uh, you know, when I got hired, I kind of already came in with a little bit of that knowledge. Um, of course, there were many things I learned once I got in, but um, that, yeah, that's kind of my background and how I got to um, North Carolina theater. And please, if you guys have questions during, feel free to stop me. I know we're gonna have time at the end, but if you have a question while I'm talking, feel free to interrupt. All right, so we'll jump into um, kind of an advertising and marketing 101. Um, these are my, I would say, rules to live by, just things to keep in mind. Um, we, and when I say we, as far as the marketing team at NC Theater, it used to be a little bigger. Now I'm actually the only full-time marketing person at the theater. Um, I work hand in hand with our director of sales who helps me a little bit with some things, but I'm pretty much the only person in house, um, day to day doing any marketing support. So, um, it's a big job, but we, um, will hope to, you know, build that team down the road. Um, but yeah, so we'll jump in. Um, like I say, advertising and marketing, um, really equals, oh my gosh, my cat's behind me. Sorry. Um, telling your brand story through words, images, or video um, in a creative and engaging way. And I have here at the end, content is king. I think 
marketers these days, especially in the specific area that I'm in with social media and PR, um, you can't just rely on other people or sources to create content for you to share. You really have to become, um, hope that goes away. You have to become, I wanna get, can you guys see this pop up here on my screen? Yeah, but we'll, we'll ignore it. I'm okay. hitting stall and then hit remind me tomorrow and it'll just leave. Yeah, thank you so much. Mm -hmm. um, so yeah, like I said, content is king. I think, you know, we do a good amount of, you know, sharing industry stories, industry news, um, but we also have to create our own content. So we're writing our blogs, we're writing our own social media content, we're updating our own website with all of that content. So that really, I would say, if you're getting into this field, really hone in on your writing, and storytelling skills because that is going to be the key um, to telling your brand story. So um, again, you know, your professor mentioned keep your advertising and marketing simple and clear. Um, very important. I think it goes into my next bullet here. The attention span of consumers gets shorter and shorter by the day. Um, I think we can all relate to that as well. You know, I find myself scrolling through things after 10 seconds because how much I can pay attention to things apparently. So um, the more concise and clear and direct you can be with your marketing, the better. Um, the shortest way you can get that message across, um, the more people you're gonna grab, uh, the longer you're gonna be able to keep their attention, even if it's for a short amount of time. Um, you want to make sure that you give them a call to action. You ask them to sign up for your newsletter, click here for more information visit our blog. So you're really making people take an action, um, again, in as simple and clear as a way, you know, as you can. Um, I say, remember the three P's here. So I think there's different um, iterations of this now, but you can say, you always need to remember, you need to market to the right person, which would be your target audience, at the right place. So that's your preferred platform. Um, whether that is you find all of your consumers love to go to your website, scroll through products, and contact you through the website, whether that's um, you find the most engagement and maybe conversions and sales through a print ad, or maybe it's social media. You find that all of your consumers live and breathe on social media. Um, whatever you put there, they pretty much do. So you have to find what that right place is. And then, of course, the right product. So giving your consumers what they want. Obviously, we're talking about musical theater, so we're gonna give them musical theater. We're gonna give them content around musical theater and the industry. We're not gonna talk about, um, you know, IT software. They don't wanna hear about that. So <laughs> just keeping in mind um, exactly what your audience wants to hear from you. And then of course, understanding how all of your brand's channels work together and covering all of your bases. So um, I listed some of our you know, channels here, our website, our social media channels, our email marketing, which includes a lot of our sales emails and newsletters that go out, um, earned media, which includes public relations, print collateral, paid advertising, which includes TV, radio, print, and digital advertising. So that would be um, spots that you purchase and you run your advertising that way. But you really having an overall understanding of how all of those things work together is really, really important. Um, you want to make sure if you're making a big announcement that that announcement is pretty much covered on at least your website, social media, and in your emails. Um, you want to have that message consistent across the board. So keeping in mind all of those channels when you're talking about a message. And then, of course, when it comes to budget, do your best to stick to the budget. Uh, don't throw money into something that isn't producing results. So I think, especially when we talk about shows and how we're marketing shows, um, we have shows that are, you know, a mama mia, right? Where people hear that title, they go crazy over it. It doesn't take too much pushing to get people to make that purchase. However, some of our smaller shows, maybe lesser known titles, you are going to have to do a little bit of extra work to get that word out there to educate people what that show or that play is about. Um, but again, being mindful of the budget. So not pouring $60,000 into budgeting and marketing a show 
when you're not making any sales. You have to stop that at some point or else you're just throwing money away. So again, paying attention to your campaigns and being smart about um, paying attention to what's working and what isn't. There's just a few things to keep in mind. Again, target audience. So how do we find our, what I call most eligible buyers? Um, some methods that any business can take to find their target audience would be some surveys, looking at your Google Analytics. So that would be really tracking um, what pages are visited on your website and if they're popular at all. Um, segmenting, so looking at demographics, psychographic, behavioral and geographic behaviors. Um, and numbers specific maybe to your market. So doing a little bit of market research. Um, our market, very different than New York City. So we are not going to do the same things that um, the big Broadway houses do. We're just not because we're not in the same area. Um, and then of course, data capturing and analysis is really, really important. We um, use a Ticketmaster database called Arctix and that basically hosts all of our patron information, shows how many tickets they've purchased and how many shows they've seen in basically the history of the software. So we can really use that to act smart and to update our campaigns as we um, move along. So that's some ways. And like I say here, surveys, we definitely rely on sur surveys at the theater. We do, um, for every show that we produce, we create a pre and post show survey. Um, so we can really gauge, especially the post-show survey, we can really gauge not only what people thought about the show, um, but we ask them questions, you know, they're not all required, but we ask them questions about their race, about um, where they live, about where they capture their news, where they like to purchase tickets. So we really get a good understanding um, of our patrons and of our attendees that way. So surveys are a really, really great um, way to do that. It's a little bit time extensive for you to obviously create that survey, but I think the results um, will really tell you everything that you need to know. So I would definitely recommend surveys. Um, a little screenshot about our audience. Um, now this isn't where exactly we want this audience to stay forever and ever, but this is where it currently is right now. So our age range, or basically our target age range for our patrons is between 55 and 65 years old. Um, they're in the higher income bracket because I think like we can all agree, um, theater tickets, entertainment tickets are kind of considered extra. You know, if you're living paycheck to paycheck, you may not be able to justify a ticket for the theater. Um, it's just not in your monthly budget. So typically our buyers are kind of in that higher income bracket. Um, and right now our audience is primarily white and Caucasian patrons. Um, again, that's something that we know isn't reflective of the triangle of Raleigh, um, but that's kind of where we're sitting right now. So a big effort that the theater has has um, undergone over the past couple years and what we plan to do in the future is really bringing in new audiences. Um, and that includes different ages as well. We want you know you guys, these young um, theater lovers to come to the theater. So we, we really, um, we're working towards that. Um, and then again, some of our patron groups, so this is kind of how we segment, like referring up to how we would find our most eligible buyer and how we would talk to them because of course, each patron group, you're gonna message to them differently. So our season subscribers, uh, whether they're a full season subscriber or a mini as we call them, so maybe they have um, a three show or a four show package out of six shows in our season. Um, then we have our single ticket buyers. So those are people who haven't subscribed um, but hey, they really loved Mamma Mia, so they bought four tickets, and they may not come to a show ever again, but they're just, um, that's what we call our single ticket buyer. And then of course we have um, our donors, sponsors, VIPs, and you know we definitely wanna build up to that you know, person who's become a subscriber, they've actually donated to the theater, and then they're an advocate for us out in the community. So they're telling their friends, they're telling their neighbors, they're telling their church groups, whatever it may be, oh my gosh, you guys have to come see a show at NC Theater. So that's really the ultimate goal, but we know that that's a stepping stone process. That doesn't happen overnight. So um, again, we build messaging um, to talk to each audience and we just try to keep them hooked for years and years to come. Moving into show selection. So I've just got a couple 
really pretty pictures here that I thought. Um, West Side Story is the first picture um, of the two dancing there. That was our um, season opening production this season. That was back in October. And then we've got Annie in the middle that we did last summer. Yes, we had a live real dog on stage. It was amazing and everybody loved her. Her name was Macy. And um, then we have a picture of our 2016 production of Mary Poppins starring Broadway uh, vet Kara Lindsay. She really kind of had a jumping off point after she starred in our show in 2016. So that was exciting to see. Um, definitely, I would say follow us on social media at NC Theater over the next couple weeks because we're doing a lot of throwbacks right now while our stages are dark. Um, so we're going to be sharing some fun content. Yeah, I saw her interview that you guys posted like two days ago, I think that she did. Yeah. That was, that's really, that's been really fun. I've actually um, been the one to reach out to some some people like her from our previous casts. And yeah, I'm uh, a huge fan. As you can see, my Newsies poster, it, she was fantastic in that. Oh, so. Yes, exactly, exactly. She actually filmed that right after our production. So that was kind of exciting, um, but yeah. I will jump into the next slide here. Um, like I said, we, I'm not involved in um, a lot of the upper you know, decisions, but um, there are only really a few select people that are. Um, so as far as show selection and how marketing fits in, um, you guys may have heard of him. Our producing artistic director is the one that selects the shows for each season. His name is Eric Woodall. We, um, we actually hired him back about two years ago, actually. it's um, He's going up on his second year of being our resident in-house artistic director, um, which we hadn't had before. So it really, it's really made a big difference and our patrons are noticing the difference of having someone in-house 24 seven artistic director versus someone that was used to be working remotely for us. Um, you know, he, he speaks before every show. He has his face seen, you know, all over. I do press with him all the time. Um, so he plays a big part and really the main part in selecting our shows. Um, he worked as a casting director in New York before coming full time to NC Theater. Um, so he brings a lot of knowledge from that space. And when he's picking the season, so he actually, uh, if we're talking about our current season, he selected all the shows in the current season, the 1920 season, and then um, coming up or 2021 season, he's also selected all the shows in that season. And again, I think when he's when he's picking these shows, he's thinking about an overall theme or message. Um, the theme and message of this current season was love, acceptance, family, finding those friends who then become your family. So that was kind of the theme of this current season, I can tell you next season's theme is more of uh, being great, soaring to new heights, celebrating what it means to be the best. Um, so you'll kind of see what I mean by that in a couple slides. Um, but uh, yeah, so some things that are determined when shows are selected. Um, we don't have our pick of every single show that has ever been on Broadway or is even, you know, a show to create because if the show rights are not available, we cannot produce that show. So that right there is the first step of saying, okay, what shows actually can regional theaters legally produce? The rights have to be released in order for that show to be produced. So in my mind, I'm thinking they probably start there, right? They're looking at what's available, what's out there. Um, and then jumping down maybe two bullets, um, thinking about our show history. So as NC Theater, we kind of have this seven to 10 year rule. So we're trying not to do shows too close together. So like we, the last time we did Annie was 2010, I believe. And then we didn't do Annie again until 2019. So really keeping a gap in there um, because then you'll start to hear from patrons. Well, I just saw that three years ago, or I went to Deepak and saw that, you know, five years ago. So we really keep in mind how recently we've done a show and that determines then again, what we pick for the current or upcoming season. Um, like some of you may know, we perform at the Duke Energy Center for the performing arts in downtown Raleigh. Um, we may be a little bit unique in that sense because some regional theaters, you know, own their own space. They have their own venue. Um, they can pretty much do whatever they want. 
not the case for us. We, since we perform out of the Duke Energy Center, we have to align and make sure that when we want to do a show, there's actually space available in our venue to even perform that show. Um, so it's really working with our city partners and our venue partners to make sure that calendaring happens. Um, and then we have, you know, availability for the show. Um, and then we can jump down to the bottom. Of course, marketability is considered, AKA picking the shows that will sell. Um, we are, NC Theater is kind of known for producing these Broadway revivals, a lot of big grand musicals, titles that people know and love. Um, but of course we want to sprinkle in some lesser known titles and some more interesting and artistic pieces. So we've really done that at least with um, the current season and then you'll see in the upcoming season how we've done that. Um, but of course, you know, the, the Mamma Mia's, the Kinky Boots, those are, those are the ones where people really get excited about and maybe eight times out of 10, someone already knows what that show is about. So you don't have to do too much education on the front end. Um, so yes, like I said, marketability is definitely considered when picking shows. So what do you do? So, so you said you, with a, with a popular show, you kind of can guess that that's going to, that's going to make a bunch of money. So right. what about some of the, the the less popular show and this is this is actually a question i think that nathan submitted early mm -hmm. on is what do you what do you do for those i mean how do you um how do you determine how you're going to get people to to get to them yeah and you know typically a lot of those lesser known titles that we have are um they're typically put into our fletcher theater so if you if you're not aware we use two different venue spaces at the Duke Energy Center. We have Raleigh Memorial Auditorium, where we put kind of the big musicals like Mamma Mia, Kingy Boots, In the Heights. The big kind of, um, you know, really produced shows are in that bigger venue. And then we have the AJ Fletcher Opera Theater, which houses about 600 uh, patrons. So it's a much smaller theater compared to the 22 seat house of Raleigh Memorial. Um, so we typically put those lesser known titles into that AJ Fletcher spot. Um, it, the show run tends to be longer, um, but you know, it's a smaller audience pool um, right off the bat. And of course, you know, when we're budgeting and projecting um, for an upcoming season, we basically, it's kind of a guessing game. You say, okay, looking at, you know, our budget for the year, we try to do um, at least 35% percent of that budget per show goes to marketing. However, yeah. you have to, like I said, you have to kind of, you don't want to dive in and spend all your money at once. You need to act smart, act smartly with your campaigns, watch them. So with like, let's say murder for two, for example, was a show last season that we did. Um, it was a two person uh, kind of comedy musical and a lot of people hadn't heard about it. We had to do a lot of education, at least um, from a content standpoint. So writing blogs, kind of giving people facts about the show ahead of time to teach them what the show is about, what they can expect, because that's a first barrier, right? If you don't know what something's about, you're really, you're timid to buy a ticket for something that you don't know what you're gonna get. So really educating up front, letting people know um, what the show's about, what they can expect. Um, so like I said, creating content around that, we did a lot of blogs on that, um, shared a lot of social media content, kind of pushing, um, pushing that message to let people know what they could expect. Um, as far as budget, like I said, we, for our smaller shows, that budget's going to be smaller, right? It's not going to be the same amount of money as we have for Mamma Mia. It's just, it's not, it's kind of comparing apples to oranges. So you just, like I said, you you have to be smart with your campaigns. We actually use a third party um, social media company um, sometimes to run some paid advertising for us on social. And they really, the benefit of doing that with a third party, if you're not able to pay for the software to use in house, is that they have that software. So they can tell you, you know, this isn't, this isn't resulting in any clicks, you're not getting any conversions, or, you know, wow, this video or picture really did it and really got people engaged so that you can, you can adapt and you can, um, you know, grow with your campaign and, you know, analyze the results as you go. If that kind of helps answer that question. Mm -hmm. 
So do you pick the audience, the target audience, or do you, <clears throat> I mean, if you're doing social media, you're, you're preaching to the converted, right? right? So how do you, do you, how do you go about, or do you go about looking at, at new audiences? And I guess that's where, you know, ads come in. Yeah, exactly. So we have, and if you're, this is technical, but if you're in your um, kind of Facebook business manager, which is where you house um, all of your advertising, if you're boosting posts, you do that in that business manager space in Facebook. Um, we actually have an audience that we've built in there. So when you go in, I don't know if anybody has done this before for a business or a company, but when you go in and if you're about to run a paid ad in Facebook, you can select, um, you can select your audience, which is what we've created. So that's the kind of the demos I mentioned earlier. So, um, that specific age group, uh, we're targeting the Raleigh Durham area. We're targeting um, people that have searched for certain keywords. So you can kind of build your audience in this business manager, um, or you can just, you can, you can kind of go in and do it organically each time. So you could select the areas that you want to uh, target. So if we wanted to branch out to Charlotte, we could start targeting people in Charlotte. Um, if we want to keep it to the triangle, we would keep that range and that kind of, um, that reach close to the triangle. Um, but yeah, like I said, we, we have our audience that we have, you know, we market to, we know is the low hanging fruit. So we select that target every single time um, because we know it works for us. Of course, if you aren't sure what your audience is, you're gonna have to play with that and test that a little bit um, to see what, you know, garners the most, the most conversions and the most engagement. Okay. Awesome. Okay, we got about uh, 10, 10 minutes left. Okay, perfect. Um, I will breeze through this a little bit. So as you guys can see, this is our um, upcoming season. Um, the image on the right shows the shows that we have in the 2021 season. Um, you can probably see an overall theme, at least with the imagery, right? We're focusing on one person because a lot of these shows center around one main person and why they're great, why we celebrate them. Um, so that's kind of the theme of this upcoming season. As far as creating that look, we work with a freelance designer to create that, you know, actually the actual graphic design part. Um, he helps us, in, you know, create our digital pieces, our print collateral, um, assets for our website, all sorts of things. Um, so myself, along with any other marketing team members, and then of course our CEO, Elizabeth Doran, and then our pro producing artistic director, Eric, um, they definitely have the biggest input as to what that season look is going to, you know, look like and how we're going to, um, really theme everything moving forward. So we start with a main season look, which is what you're seeing right here on the right. Um, how we work with a designer is we basically explain that vision, right? We, we say, this is our goal. This is what we want to convey. Um, the designer puts together a few concepts for us to review. We typically stick to around three rounds of edits, um, really more for pricing reasons. It gets very costly if you're going up into five, six, seven rounds of edits for um, a given design. And then, you know, hopefully after three rounds, we land on a final look and feel. And then you've got your kind of creative look for the season. Um, like I mentioned, of course, we're going to always keep in mind our target audience and play to their emotions. So especially in theater, show visuals, anything you're looking at, production photos, all of that evokes emotion in people. Um, it represents a theme of the piece in the season. Um, and you often associate those visuals with a memory, whether that's um, oh my gosh, you know, oh, I grew up with Peter Pan and I love Peter Pan so much. So you're looking at that and you're just seeing, you know, that cheery young face and you're like, oh my gosh, you know, I'm just so excited for that show. Or maybe it's of course nine to five talk about, you know, playing to our target audience nine to five and ring of fire were definitely purposefully put in. Um, those are our Southern audience shows. I mean, those are what our patrons love and been begging for nine to five for years. Um, it's based on some of the music from Dolly Parton. So obviously a lot of our patrons are really going to love that is of course uh, ring of fire as well. With the uh, songs of Johnny cash. So um, that kind of goes back to show selection and thinking about really what our audiences love and what they would want to see in an upcoming season. So that kind of gives you an idea of a visual. 
Um, some promotional materials we use on a show by show basis. And this is really where I come in and this is what I use to promote the show. Um, we have a photographer come in and shoot production photos during our dress rehearsals. He basically edits those, turns it back around to me by the next morning for me to start sharing on social media. We put on our website, put in our emails. I email out to press and our show reviewers because that's basically the morning of opening night. And then we use those photos and the video for the remainder of the week to continue to push the show. Um, that's really when we do a lot of sales in that final week of um, show because we've got all these great visuals and we've got this video and people can actually see what's, you know, the show's about. And there, of course, that word of mouth kicks in and, you know, it, it can really, it can really do a lot in the last uh, week of shows. Um, so in addition to production photos, we, we shoot B roll, which is basically um, kind of layered clips of the show um, per actors equity rules, which is a whole conversation in itself. We are not allowed to tape more than 30 seconds of each musical number in a show. Um, so we have to make sure that we stick within those guidelines. But of course, really our B-roll is only used for promotional use um, on broadcast. So we don't really publicly you know, disperse that everywhere. We use that for specific reasons. Um, and that's okay when we're talking about the actors', actors equity rules. Um, like, oh, sorry, go ahead. Oh. I was gonna say quickly, and then from the B-roll, we create little social media montage videos. So of course, like I said, they're quick. They're only 15 to 30 seconds on social media because that is the attention span of people these days. Um, but really, those are really shareable, which is the key. What can we do that's shareable? So people will see that and go, oh my God, you know, I saw this show on Monday and I just absolutely loved it. So um, the clips are really beneficial for us on Facebook and Instagram. Um, we also load those onto our YouTube channel as well. Do you need to worry about um, other rights to broadcast, like for the you know, for the when you get the rights to the show? Yes. So we actually <clears throat> we never like we never film the entire show and post that for people to watch um, outside of the theater. That would actually be um, breaking the rules there. So we don't do that at all. Like I said, we only use that B-roll for promotional use. Um, and it's kind of kept internally for the most part. Um, I think later on, we typically post that on YouTube. But again, we we don't sell that. We don't use that to um, as a way for people to kind of watch the show. Uh, we only use that for a specific reason. So Okay. So you don't... So, so is the general rule, if you don't actually sell it as your own, you're allowed to use 30 seconds right right okay. exactly and, yeah. and even when we mash it up i mean our b-roll tends to be maybe five to six minutes long but again we it's it's a compilation of only about 30 seconds of a couple songs from the show so um it's really like a screenshot of the show it's not anything close to being a full production um, okay and of yeah, course, that's one thing that we have worried about here. We want to do video for for our shows, but the the question has been, well, what you know, what, yeah, what, what, what are the rights that we have? So yeah, and we we always we read our show writers really carefully, our contracts really carefully, um, to make sure we're not breaking any rules because they are pretty strict. And I think, you know, in this time that we're in right now, we could see those rules maybe eventually loosen up. Um, but for right now, they, they are not. So we, we try to stick to those rules. And then of course, oh my gosh, logo use and everything kind of plays into that as well. But, um, we have to, yeah, <laughs> not enough time today to go into that, but, yeah. um, I will end here with a little bit of crisis communication, um, and more PR, which is, like I said, what a, a big focus of mine is, um, mainly just PR for the, for the company and for our shows. So like I said, it's a perfect timing for a real world example. Um, we all know the time that we're living in right now. Um, the last three weeks have been pretty insane for us. Like I said, we perform out of the Duke Energy Center. So as far as the decision to um, even be able to host shows in the coming weeks or, you know, reschedule shows, we had to kind of wait and hear the word from our venue and really again from the city i mean the city was making these mandates for businesses and entertainment venues to shut down so um in that case we really all we could do at that point was be um informed from our partners you know read as much of the news as we possibly could and then be clear and informative to our patrons um 
and acting quickly with those messages was really important. Not jumping the gun and make, you know, giving out false claims by any means, but definitely when, when information was available, we made sure that we let our patrons know about that. Um, especially in a time like this, no comment or not making any comments or not publishing any news doesn't cut it. Um, our patrons and our media really need to hear from us because they need to inform the public about what's going on. So, um, you know, we've had an influx of just email questions and calls over the past week of what do I do with my tickets? What are you guys going to do? Are you canceling? Are you rescheduling? So it's really, I mean, people want to know. So coming up, up with an internal communications plan um, to then execute externally is um, really what I was involved in over the last couple of weeks. And of course, keeping our internal teams tight in that communication so that our overall messaging was consistent was key. Um, we don't want to have people on the phones that work in our sales department telling someone, oh yeah, we're going to reschedule for this date when that hasn't been announced to the public that maybe hasn't even been decided yet. So we just really keeping a tight communication among our internal teams uh, was really important at this stage. Um, and like I said, updating our information across all of our platforms, website, social media, emails, um, giving frequent updates to people. So we've started over the past couple of weeks, a weekly newsletter that's gone out, um, like I said, every week to all of our patrons in our email database um, with general information about our um, show dates. You know, our box office is physically closed right now. So reminding them of that, letting them know how they can contact us in the meantime. Um, and then just yesterday, of course, we announced our uh, finalized rescheduled show dates for the remainder of this season and then our upcoming season. So, um, like I said, keeping that information flowing for patrons is really important. Um, of course, being transparent and as honest with people as possible only creates more trust and more loyalty during a shaky time like this. So, you know, it's okay to say, if someone asks you something, it's okay to say, you know, I'm not really sure. I need to go back and ask, um, you know, my higher ups about that, but I will get back to you. It's okay. Being transparent. Don't just tell someone something that they want to hear. Um, if you know, it's not really true at the end of the day. And then of course that kind of goes into don't claim to be an expert. We have in no shape or form in the last couple of weeks, given any health advice to our patrons, we have just given them the information that's at hand. We've let them know that our Duke Energy Center partners, um, this was before the shutdown of the building, um, were really doing their part in making sure everything was clean, sanitized, um, so that people were feeling comfortable if they were gonna come to a show that they weren't gonna get sick. Um, but we are definitely not here to give health advice because we are not healthcare professionals. That's just something to keep in mind. Um, but yeah, that, that really kind of covers just the craziness that's going on right now. I mean, it, it changes so much day to day that you really have to be nimble. You have to be ready to adapt um, again and um, communicate those messages and those updates quickly and efficiently. That's really the key to crisis communication. So I'm done rambling. Did I, did I um, hit, I think I probably hit some of your questions, but if there's anything else that I didn't hit, please. I had a question. Sure. So are you, you said you had like some graphic designers that you work with, specifically the contractor. So are you doing any content creation or is that all left up to designers? You said you do a lot of the Facebook posts. So, well, that's, that's a good point. So they create, our, our graphic designer creates some of our social media graphics, but really on a day-to-day -day basis, um, a lot of the things that you probably see on our channel, I'm actually creating in Canva. So um, if you aren't at a company that's lucky enough to have an in-house graphic designer who would really be in charge of creating really your day-to-day -day materials and assets, um, then you're probably like me who had to learn really quickly how to use Canva, which is a free photo editing tool, <laughs> and really become a little bit of an expert in that graphic design space. Um, but of course, if it's a if it's a more complicated design, and of course, if it's our season look, our graphic designer, you know, the person that's really skilled in that area is going to be creating that um, those, those details for us. I had a question. Um specifically about um, like the, the the different demographics that tend to make up your audience uh, as yep. a theater. 
And you talked a good bit about that, but I want to know how that specific audience uh, affects the types of marketing that uh, you tend to focus on for the theater, uh, like whether it's different forms of print or social media and uh, what, how much that demographic influences uh, the types of marketing material that you choose to put out for the theater. Yeah, definitely. And it, it, it heavily influences what we put out. Um, like I said, a lot of our patrons, um, majority fall kind of in that um, middle-aged range, but um, there's a good number that are even over 65. So up, uppers of 70s and 80s. Um, and we really, you know, as you can guess, technology isn't, you know, second nature to them. So they, um, they're they really the ones that still love to get something in the mail. They love to get their tickets mailed to them. They don't want to manage that online. They do not want to text it to them because they're like, what is a text message? So, um, <laughs> um, so we definitely, we have to, like you said, market to those different age groups and demographics. Um, you would think print, because everything you hear, print advertising and, and magazines are suffering right now because print's kind of going out the window. However, for our patrons, that's not the case. So we do a ton of mailings. We do um, postcards with special offers. We, like I said, we mail season tickets to them. We just mail general kind of overall collateral, marketing collateral. We of course mailed out our season brochures um, and they can, of course, some of that is mailing order forms to them so they can easily just fill that out with pen and paper and mail it right back to us. But we still do a lot of business that way. However, that's not the future. So we are more and more each day, especially right now, given the current situation, moving towards online um, completely because that's where actually our venue is moving over the next year or two. So we have to, we have to keep up. Um, as far as Instagram and social media goes, um, I mean, that's my world. I'm 28 years old. You guys are even younger than me. So like that's where we live. Um, we want those people to come to the theater. We want this age group engaged. So we're really putting a lot of efforts into social media as well um, to get that younger demographic in the doors. So yes, we definitely, we have to segment and think about who we're talking to. And that really determines how we market to them. Cool. Thank you. Anyone else? I had a question. Yeah. Um, what goes into creating a budget for like your entire season? You talked a little bit about um, a larger budget for, you know, a bigger show, but how do you, I guess what my question is, how do you create a number for a season? Right. And that, like I said, that's a little bit, you know, I'm not involved in those really great conversations. However, I can tell you, we look at, you know, our CEO and our artistic director look at basically overall budget for the year. So we, we pretty much operate on a $4 million budget every single year. Um, that's kind of split between generated profit from sales. So ticket sales. And then the other half kind of comes from fundraising and sponsors and donors, things, things of that nature. So if you can think of it in two buckets, um, obviously the more ticket sales we, we sell and the more donations and sponsorships we get, the more that $4 million, you know, dollars increases. Um, and then we have a little bit more money to play with. So, you know, they start by looking at, you know, where are we at as far as profit from the previous year? Um, where are we kind of carrying over into the next season? And then as far as the show by show basis, I mean, it's really looking at how expensive are the shows, right? So you have to purchase the rights to the show. You have to hire all the crew. You have to pay the cast members. You have to, you know, you may be building the set. We, we often build our sets, but there's often times when we rent the set from another theater or a touring production. Um, so all those costs come into play. And then, you know, you're looking at kind of what's left over and you're saying, well, we project that we could make X amount in ticket sales. Um, and that kind of becomes the overall budget and projected revenue per show. Um, and then as far as marketing, like I said, a piece of that pie, um, has to be, you know, obviously designated for marketing. So paid advertisements, TV, radio, uh, digital spots. So it all kind of breaks out in, you know, into little pieces. 
Um, but the production value is high. We, we want to put on high quality musical theater and that's not cheap. So, that, you know, a lot of the time we pay more to do a show than we make in sales. Um, that's kind of how it shakes out. That's how it shakes out for most theaters, I would think. Um, but it's just, you know, we, we hold ourselves to that kind of quality standard. And right now that's something that we don't want to sacrifice. So we know that we, you know, it's going to be a pretty penny. Well, that's where you get your mm -hmm. donations coming in. Exactly. You mentioned before that um, the, the, the a, a figure, maybe 30% or 35% yes. dedicated to marketing. Yep. And that's, you, you don't want to really go above that. Um, it, it, you know, again, if you're, if you're talking about a massive budget, you may, you may be able to afford to go over 35% of that budget, you know, dedicated to marketing. Um, however, you know, you, again, you need to be smart about it and you need to, um, watch your campaigns. Don't pour all the money into something then to find out, Oh, this, this really isn't generating any ticket sales or it's just not, it's not doing what we thought it would do. So, you know, um, our marketing director who she, we don't have a current in-house marketing director right now, but what she would do is basically, you know, look at the budget she was given, um, work with all of our different, uh, radio buyers, TV, you know, digital buyers and, you know, work out prices with them to run these campaigns for our shows. Typically we actually, the hard hitting advertising usually doesn't even start until two months before a show is supposed to open because we find that our buyers buy a little bit later. Um, they don't buy a year in advance. They buy two to three months in advance of a show. Um, so our advertising doesn't kick in until then, because again, it would probably be a waste of money because people are going to forget about it. It's just, you know, they're busy. It's going to fall off their radar. So why pour $20,000 into TV advertising five months ahead of time when you can wait and then you can really get that message uh, frequency up a lot more closer to the show, um, which we've found that's that's a that's a benefit to us, and that's how our buyers typically buy. Okay, cool. Anyone else? We got time for one more question. All right. Well, cool. Well, thank you, Danny. Uh, this was really really informative. Um, of course. Really, just it was so good to get a you know, a sense of what it's like to do this in the real world. And a lot of what you were talking about kind of echoes what we had been talking about in class for the last, you know, the last three months. So yeah, it's very cool. So, right. so well, thank you. you. I feel like I rambled. So please, if you have, <laughs> um, if you have questions um, that I didn't answer, please reach out to me, email me um, anytime. I've got my information up here. Um, but I know, Charles copied cool. me on the email from this morning. So uh, don't hesitate to reach out. Yes, and I'll send you all uh, Danny's contact info. And, uh, and uh, th those questions I sent you, Danny, um, I think we may have covered all of them. But if we didn't, um, would you mind giving us answers just sort of offline? Sure, yeah. I can, I can kind of write some written responses back for you guys. Exactly, exactly. Yeah. exactly. Yep. Yes, and I'm sure if you're looking for interns, I know. I know. NCT is always looking for interns. I had a question about that. Actually, uh -huh. I'm sorry, I didn't know if it was appropriate for now. Um, I was just. <laughs> I just don't want to come out of left field. Um, cool. so are you guys still hiring interns with all of the crisis response stuff going on right now? So funny enough, um, my poor, poor marketing intern literally started the Thursday before we basically started working from home remotely for the foreseeable future. Mm -hmm. So um, she's doing some remote work for me right now. Of course, we hope to have normalcy back by the summer. So then we would be all back in the office, kind of pushing forward. Um, so yes, to answer your question, we are still taking interns. Are we certain about what that's going to end up being? And functioning like at this point? No, because it kind of determines when we're able to get back into the office. Um, we've rescheduled our next show to be um, at the end of July. So, you know, at least we have, we have something to work towards now. We have final dates in place to where we've got, you know, work that would need to happen. Um, we have internships in, of course, my realm. So marketing and PR, 
Um, we have internships in our development department. So that's our fundraising team. And then we have production interns. So they will be really working on stage, um, you know, with the stage management team, props, um, sets, everything like that. So it's there's a couple different options um, that's actually on our website. And I can shoot you guys that link as well. Um, but yeah, we, we have interns all year round. So please. Cool. Yeah, please, please do. These, these guys are great. Um, and we're going to be tackling fundraising next week too. So if anybody oh, has great. an interest in that, um, yeah. So <laughs> great. So uh, today there's a class participation quiz. Uh, so please go ahead and take that and then uh, read uh, chapter 11 in Ryan and we'll start talking about fundraising. I'm going to figure out if Friday is a holiday or not. Um, we'll see. So I think it still stays a holiday. That's good Friday, right? I'm pretty sure, Friday, but let's keep it a holiday. Yeah, yeah. Well, we'll we'll see. We'll see. It's whatever. It's whatever Friday. my boss says. If my boss says I got to be here, you guys got to be here. So, ver be here. So what? All right. All right. Great. Well, thanks again, and uh, I will talk to you all, uh, except you, Danny, next week, yeah. and I'll talk to you, Danny, periodically. <laughs> All right. Thank you so All much right. again, guys. Have a Thank good one. You. Bye, Danny. Absolutely. Thank you. Thank you.